Want to achieve network marketing success? Then you're in the right company. Hello, and welcome to Leave Nothing to Chance, hosted by networking marketing giant, John Solider. Learn everything you need to know about the network marketing space from somebody who's actually done it. Join us every week for front row seats as we feature some of the finest and most successful personalities in network marketing. Leave nothing to chance. Join us now. Well, it is my privilege to uh, introduce two long-term super success stories in network marketing and, and to illustrate uh, people that are in one company for a long time. Um, we, from time to time, hear people leaving companies and, you know, they're just in with company A and they go to company B and that happens. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of us that have built careers with one company. And you may not know our names because we've built careers with one company. And I'll illustrate that this way. I was recognized um, oh, about 10 years ago uh, by uh, Success Magazine's uh, owner, uh, Stuart Johnson. Uh, he had an event here in Dallas and myself and some of my colleagues were invited to that. And I'll never forget that at the introduction that I was standing with Jeff Roberti, uh, industry icon, one of the most successful people in our industry. And Jeff and I were standing together, having a drink and catching up. And a bunch of guys came in together and you could tell what they were together. They were, they were obviously from the same company. And I said to Jeff, I said, who are those guys? And he said, I don't know. And about five minutes later, John Addison, who I did know, who was the then uh, CEO of that particular uh, company that those distributors belonged to, came in and I said to John, I said, you know who those guys are? He said, yeah, they're with me. They happen to have, have been A.L. Williams distributors or today called Primerica. And they had been there for, in some cases, 25, 30, 35 years. And it illustrated the fact that none of us knew them because they had never left. They were in a, a company that had established itself well in the marketplace and they were able to achieve with it on a consistent basis. So therefore they, they chose to stay. Well, that's not the only company like that. There's a lot of great companies in our industry. So I wanna introduce uh, two gentlemen that have stayed the course, led in their particular companies for many, many years. Uh, Keith Hooper, uh, we never mentioned company names, but uh, the company you're with, you're celebrating your- 25th year, 25 years. 25th year. And Joe Garcia, you are celebrating your- 21st year. 21st year, so that's 46 years. And the company that I am currently with, I'm going on 25 also. Uh, so that's 67 years just between three people here. We were going to have a third guest, unfortunately. Uh, uh, Arlene Lowy had a, a little health challenge today. and She's been with her company 27 years. So, you know, you start adding it up and you start realizing that these are careers that we, the three of us and others in our industry, have built. So I guess, uh, Joe, let's start with you. Why have you stayed with the company that you're with? What did they do right where you said, even during maybe some challenging times, I'm staying here, I'm planting my flag, and I'm staying with you guys? You know, I look back at my history, John. You know, that's a question that uh, I've actually never been asked. Uh, but if I, I got started in the industry in 93, and uh, that company that I, you know, back then I didn't even know what a, a great compensation plan was or what a great company would be. Lasted three years. The company went bankrupt. So I didn't leave it. They, the company left me. And after a couple of months of uh, looking for a new home, I started with a small little company uh, out of uh, Longmont, Colorado in the uh, fall of 96. And three years into it, I kept on telling the, the company uh, management team, we've got to go global. This internet thing is going to change the world. If you're not doing business globally, you're going to miss out on the greatest wealth curve or paradigm shift that this industry has ever seen. So in 2000, the company had uh, created a, back then it was revolutionary, uh, a online back office system that, that uh, we all have today, but back then it was uh, really um, revolutionary. And instead of uh, doing it under that company's brand, they decided to start a brand new company. So if you look back at my whole, whole history, I've actually never left the company. So that company, we launched a brand new uh, sister company and kept the company separate. And because of, that was my vision of going global, you know, I bought into that vision and, and launched with the new brand. So I'm actually very loyal, John, uh, when it comes to my relationships, when it comes to my business relationships. So it's one of my... Um, 
top five values in life is showing loyalty and committing to the end. You know, um, I would joke around for years that the Titanic, if I was on the Titanic, I would say, hey, John, stay with me. We're not drowning, you know, we're, uh, everything's going to be okay. So just because of my um, positive mindset, my focus, uh, when I make a commitment, you know, it's for life. And that's how, how I've always been. And, you know, that, that's rewarded you. I mean, we, we've obviously interviewed each other before, uh, but I know the success that you've had, the tremendous success that you continue to have around the world because you stayed the course. And I compare it, and, and people may laugh at this. You two guys will probably laugh at this. I think I've shared it with both of you before, but it's kind of like uh, round 14 of Rocky 1. If you think about that scene, right, and just to refresh everybody's memory, right. it's the scene where Balboa's is getting a you-know-what knocked out of him, right? And it's about the third time he's on the canvas. And Burgess Meredith is his, is his manager, and he looks at him, and he's saying, stay down, stay down. And what does he do? He gets up. And even Apollo's looking across the ring at him like, you're insane. That's sometimes what we go through in building a company. And it's not easy. And Joe's lived it. Keith, you've lived it too. I mean, what, what's, what's kept you around 25 years through, boy, and I, and I know your history because I've shared some of it with you, you know, the ups and downs and changes and companies sold and, you know, CEO of the month and everything else. What kept you focused on sticking around as long as you have? Well, you know, I, I think Joe talked that very, very succinctly to the point that you make a decision, okay? I mean, when, if somebody's looking for the perfect company, OK, let me know if you find one, because I don't know of any. I've seen about what is it? What was the number? Twenty five hundred companies come and go every single year. So obviously there's no perfect company out there. But when you're looking at the business, it's my business. The company's job is to make sure the product is, is shipped on time and it is what they say it is and to pay. So if it can accomplish those two things, then everything else is, you know, can be fixed. And it is going to be fixed. You may run into rough times. You know, my background is that of a good old farm boy. What does somebody call a farmer? Somebody that's outstanding in their field. Okay. So we're going to do that. And you're going to do that in the business. But most people quit just shy of success. They quit just before success arrives. Just before they were going to hear that, that, that interview, you know, that you and Joe did. They gave them that little insight that, that clicked that caused them to, to take off with their company. So what do they do? They go off and they sign up with another company. They had maybe 20 people in their organization, or maybe they had a thousand people in the organization. But when they moved, they ended up with three or four. All the good people either stayed where they were at, or they'd said, hey, I'm not doing this anymore. Because you got to remember, when we ask somebody to join us in network marketing, we're asking them for the two most valuable things they have, their time and their mm -hmm. credibility. That's why I'm often, I'm, I'm you know, when somebody says, well, you know, I, I don't, you have to do your own diligence. I don't know much about this company. Well, that tells me that I don't want to know anything about it either. Okay. So the point is we ask people for the two most valuable things they have, their time and their credibility. The other part of this that I think is so important is not everybody is full time. Not everybody's looking for a full time income. Not everybody's looking for that. There's other things that motivate them. You know, John, you're familiar with my background. Okay. I'm third generation farmer. My son, my son is a fourth generation farmer, banker, you know, cattle dealer. My grandson is involved in our business. We've got that. I've got a couple of other businesses. Well, network marketing is not my full-time income, but it's one of my other incomes, one of my other businesses, but it's a business. It's not a hobby. And too often people join in network marketing and they go, well, I'm going to do this part-time. And what they really meant to say, I'm going to do it no time. And then they can't figure out why there's no success with it. Okay. And I think that that's part of what causes that 25 years is a point of look every single, every single week. Okay. Every single month, year in, year out, I do the same things over and over again. And it's, it has rewarded me quite, quite handsomely financially as one of my businesses, John. Well, you know, and both of you gentlemen are with, with, with great companies. Okay. That have stayed the course that have gone through their own baptismal fires as, as companies. And yet you guys stayed and now you're both being rewarded, not only financially, but also seeing people in your organizations achieve greatness around the world. So let me ask you both this, Joe, we'll go back to you to answer this first. Uh, what's the secrets 
to picking the right company because our, our both our companies that we're representing here, both of the gentlemen represent are great companies, but there's other great companies. What is that when somebody listens to this show and they say, hey, I'm considering network marketing or maybe I'm in a company and, and, and it, it, it's one of these things that isn't going to go the course. They've already figured that out. What's the secret when they look again and say, hey, I'm making a business decision here. I want to be like Joe, 21 years at his company. I want to be like Keith, 25 years at his company. I want to be like others in the industry that have a career where they're not switching companies every year and calling the same people and, you know, telling them the same story again about the uh, the Chinese billionaire that's going to build a company and give away money or some other nonsense like that that we've all heard. How do they make that business decision conscientiously? For their family to build that financial fortress around themselves and their loved ones, and you can only do that if you're in a company that that that's sustainable. How do you know? How do you look at what are the particulars, Joe? Well, if you go back to when I got started in the industry, and I'm I, I look back, I'm just thinking about my 28 years, John. And the one thing that I had I was very clear on is I was in love with my dream. And, you know, most people need to understand the, the secret to life is understanding what you want in life. And you need to fall in love with it. You know, I always tell people, uh, when you fall in love with it, the universe must make it happen for you. I don't know if you remember when you first fell in love with your wife, your beautiful Canadian wife, John. She was playing in your, the movie in your mind 24-7. You didn't have to think about, okay. Set an alarm at one o'clock. I got to think about her now. Uh, she was playing always in the movie in your mind. So with me, I had fallen in love with my dream well before I knew about network marketing. So if I look back now on my 28 years, every single step that's happened to me was determined by the universe because I was in love with my dream. Every single decision what moved me in the right direction so what happens with most people is they they get involved in a business and they're not their clarity or their vision is not clear in terms of what they really want in life so they're basically playing when you're you're building a business that way you're playing russian roulette you're playing russian roulette because you're not involving the universal principle is what you focus on is what you attract in life. And mm. it's the most powerful principle there is. So falling in love with your dream, being very clear of where you want to go in life, what you want to achieve, and falling in love with that process, falling with that love with that destination, guaranteed your decision, your the universe will lead you in the right direction 100% of the time. Love it. Provided you're you're listening too, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I look back and all the defining moments, like incredible defining moments, that's happened to me in my business, is it was like I was guided, and I was because I was in love with my dream. So we've all come across people that have joined network marketing. Their sister involved them, their brother involved them, their family member or friend, and they get in and. Um, they start to see a little bit of success. So that kind of process, uh, you know, happens all the time in our industry. But what, what I always want people to get to and understand, for life to work for you in all areas of life, you need to have a destination. Or else you're going to be living your life like default. So random crazy things will continue to happen to you because you're not telling the universe exactly what you want. You know, Joe, as, as I look and I and I hope um, I know a lot of people listen to these podcasts and I do myself, to be honest with you, most of the time I just listen to them. I don't watch them. But I hope you turn on the YouTube camera that comes with this show and you look at Joe's office for a minute, because to the left, my, my left, Joe's right. He's got dream big. And underneath that, he's got a map. I think that's the map of the world, Joe, if I can see correctly. Correct, yeah. correct. And how many countries in the world are you now represented in? Uh, 60 plus countries, 60 plus. So you've impacted because you lived your dream because you were focused on your dream because you picked a good company that stayed the course as a company. You've impacted people's lives in 60 plus other countries. That's yes. 
huge. You know, you know, 1990, uh, uh, go back to 1998, which was another um, great defining moment for me in terms of longevity is this is previous to the, you know, the sister company, right? So 98, we had some company was going through some major financial challenges due to poor management decisions. And I went on a conference call. We just hired a new president and he went on to, um, to share this incredible vision that he had, right? And all the major six figure earners in that company and, and seven, we were on there. And about 30 minutes into the call, I thought to myself, am I in the right company here? Am I in the same company as these people? Because all they did was just complain one, uh, after, you know, they didn't let the gentleman talk. They complained about we were behind in, uh, in commissions and the back orders that were happening. And I thought to myself afterwards, what was the difference between myself and everyone in that call? 20, um, so now we're going on 20, what, 24 years later? Every single one of those people that were on that call are no longer in the industry, except mm -hmm. for myself and my business partner, Dan. Think about that. And I thought it was, and I can guarantee you, most all of them did not have a new dream. They had achieved their dream, but they didn't have their new dream. And they let their mind get into a, a space because that's what happens when you don't have a dream you have a destination the weeds will take control mm. and as jim road joan Rohn says guaranteed 100 percent. you start to see things differently that will hurt you and so when you have a vision you know uh, uh you're now empowering yourself to be aligned with what the universe is giving you Great, great. Keith, uh, thoughts on picking the right couple? Well, you know, what, what Joe was just sharing about having the dream. You've got to have what it is. Big dreams have magic. Little dreams have no magic. We've all heard it. People think it's cliche. It isn't. It's true. People say, well, what do you want? Okay, well, after you've been doing something for a long time, what do you want gets to be pretty, you know, mundane to the point. What I want is simply more. Whatever it is, I just want more. Okay. You know, when people say, well, you know, well, what is it financially? Or you, know, you got a financial goal. It's just more. Okay. What, and, and a number of things, you know, Sandra and I, my wife and I, you know, we've gone, gone out to dinner with some very nice, very nice places in San Francisco. If you go to the French Laundry in, in uh, Napa, okay, you better have $2,000 with you. Okay. For dinner. And that's yeah. for two. And that's for two. <laughs> okay, so you know, so when you talk about what do you want, you want more. Most people get into network marketing; they don't have a goal, they don't have a plan. They 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 want somebody to hold their hand. They're looking for somebody to become a leader. Who's the leader that I'm going to follow? Well, how about you become that leader? How about listening to the podcast? How about listening to what Joe has to say? How about listening to other people? How about reading some books? Okay, how about investing into yourself? Become the leader you're looking to find to lead you and become that leader and develop those dreams. What are those dreams? Make sure they're visual. Make sure you, you know, no one can describe to me a million dollars. You can't describe it, but you can describe what a million dollars will buy. And in, if you live where I live in California, not much. Okay. <laughs> if you're going down to where I'm building our house in Idaho, <laughs> you know, a well, little a more, way. but not a lot, a but way. not a lot more. Okay. <laughs> And so you look at that. So once again, visualize those dreams, have those dreams, understand what you can do. Here's the point. If you're, if you don't, if you can't walk out of the grocery store, when the, when the Girl Scouts are selling cookies or the kids are there selling candy for the church, and you can't walk over and have a little fun with those kids and have them give you the sales pitch on why you want to buy the candy and the cookies and make them go through all of that and have, go through that process and then give them the money and walk away and don't take the candy or cookies because you don't need them. Neither do I. Okay. And, but you go through that process. If you can't do that, OK, you need to look at getting involved in network marketing. You need to look at developing another source of income. You need to be able to look at what are you dreaming about? OK, I mean, you walk at people, you see them walk up and the kids are selling the, 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 the Girl Scout cookies. They're concerned about the price of the Girl Scout cookies. They're not concerned about the dream of what they're able to do and make life better. So mm -hmm. Joe talked about it with the dreams. 
Develop the dream. Spend some time in your dream. Live within your dream. Joe talked about it very clearly. Live within that dream, and then it becomes a reality. You're 100% correct, Keith. Right on. I think for most people who, in this topic, dreaming or goal, goal-oriented goal people, or just this topic in general, uh, it's, it's important for people to understand why you need to do this. So uh, I was sharing a story with uh, a team overseas the other day because I had a question, you know, why do I need a dream? So I, I kind of sh- responded because not because everyone else is doing it or it's the secret to sex success. I kind of shared with him what the science behind it is that all about. So if we look at how the universe works, guys, everything that we see with our eyes today, our cars, our houses, the internet, uh, this platform, Zoom, all started with a thought. You know, quantum science now in the last 20 years, if you go back to all the way back to Jesus Christ, all the great teachers that we've had on this earth, you, you put, pick up any self-help book out there, what is the premise of every self-help book? Thoughts become things. What we focus on is what we attract in life. So most people understand that, but really at a core center, they really don't believe it or because they don't understand it fully and how the science works, whatever the reason is. But when you think of thought today, uh, uh, what happens in that process is we have these quantum biparticles, everything that is made in this world is made up of these quantum biparticles or just energy pockets. Science has proven in the last 20 years, these energy pockets have a thinking brain behind it. It's connected to everything that is. So what happens is when you focus on something that you really want, let's say it's a 1967 Corvette, you're dying to get one of this, this cars. You're in love with this dream. Immediately, because of the detail, these quantum biparticles are now listening to what you want. So in a parallel universe, this car starts to form. And this car now becomes yours through what we call a gestation period or a time period. You know, for example, a female, when they get pregnant, nine months later, there's a baby. So in gestation periods, when it comes to a dream, varies from person to person. And it's all about the emotion. So when you fall in love with something, that's when these quantum biparticles are listening. And they start to form in that parallel universe, which eventually eventually becomes yours through through a gestation period, through repetition. So, So if you don't have a dream that's specific, these quantum biparticles don't know what that means. So for example, financial goals, like a million dollars, as Keith was sharing, these, these, the energy pockets, these quantum biparticles don't know what this is. So they will never be able to form into this million dollars because it's very difficult for all of us to visualize money. It's what you're gonna do with the money that you have to fall in love with. That's where the, the magic happens. So when you understand that process, then people will understand how things come to us. When, when we understand how things come to us, then we realize, oh my God, I got to, get a destination. I got to fall in love with this dream. You know, got to find out what we want in life, you know? Well, you know, to go one step further, go go ahead. You made a great point there, Joe, that people need to look at this. And and oftentimes when you join network marketing and you start a business and people say, well, all you talk about is money. Okay. I'm not, I'm not that driven by money. Okay. The people you Mm -hmm. owe it to damn sure wish you were driven by money. OK, because they'd sure like you to pay it to them. OK, <laughs> but when somebody tells me that they're not interested in money. OK, I'm sorry. Money makes the world go round. If you can't give the money to the charities that you want to give to. OK, you're not impacting this world. You're not making dreams happen. OK, you're not living your dream and you're impacting other people's dreams because you're not living up to your potential. Joe talks about it. God, we're giving God given talents. Some of you have more talents than, than I do. Most of you, okay, are given other, other talents. But if you don't use them, then you're not being responsible. And you need to become responsible. You need to read the books, attend the seminars, look at, look at the stuff that's here, sit down and invest in yourself 
you know, and, and become a better person, you know, and all this is going to take time. The good news is it, it will all come to come to pass. The bad news is you're going to, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some things that, that make that happen. Right, Joe? Yeah, and Keith, that doesn't happen if you don't know where you're going. If you don't have a destination and you're not in love with it. Let me, let me throw something in here and I'd love you guys answer on this. Okay. I'll tell you a, a very quick story. I was doing some consulting work for a company that was going to be bought by one of my consulting clients. And he eventually wound up buying this company. And he invited me to the very first convention that he was going to own the company. And I went out, this was in 2004 or five, I think it was. And uh, anyway, I went out and um, got to be lunchtime. And uh, Tony Robbins had been the last speaker. So the owner of the company, he went off with him. I didn't get invited to lunch, unfortunately, with Tony. But uh, I wish I had. Uh, but anyway, all that said, um, I looked for a place to eat lunch, right? I mean, like, it's like, I don't know, thousands of distributors. I don't know anybody. I don't, the only person I know in the company is the owner. Picture that for a minute, right? Uh, so, so uh, and I'm like, and he's not available. So I'm just going to go and you know, sit at a table and eat lunch with, you know, whoever. So I sit down at this table. And this is where our industry really got me, guys. And, and, and both you guys know I have a financial background in, in addition to network marketing. Um, and this is where I really got our business. This is really funny. And I hope this helps the people listen. I'd love both you guys' thoughts on this and, and, and a question around it. But anyway, long story short, this couple shared with me that they had been receiving checks from this company since 1959. And I was like, 1959? I wasn't born in 1959. Keith, you were. Joe, you weren't even thought about yet. My parents, my parents were still talking about maybe having a son. <laughs> you weren't even thought about it. Keith, you were about, what, 10 years old at the time. So, I mean, we're talking a long time ago, right? And um, I left that meeting and, and had a nice lunch with them. And, of course, they tried to recruit me the whole time when they realized I wasn't a distributor in a company. And, of course, I couldn't tell them what my role was being there. But uh, fast forward, I spent the next week uh, working in that company's office with some of its, its executive team. And I found that some of the sales leaders corporately were what they call legacy distributors, kids or grandkids meaning that mom or dad or grandma or grandpa in some cases, as I said, having an older company, had started the distributorship and passed away or retired and, you know, the kid now owned it. And all of a sudden, that generational wealth that we think about in traditional business, right? Grandpa started the lumber yard in the town you live in and you now own it because grandpa's six foot under and you own it, whether you want to or not, right? I'm thinking network marketing, when you do it right, in a company like you two gentlemen have. This business isn't yours. This business is your family's. Eventually, your children will inherit your distributorships. Eventually, maybe your grandchildren, maybe grandchildren you don't even know, will wind up owning your distributorship, assuming that your companies keep doing the right thing you know, in the marketplace, and both your companies, I'm sure, will. Point being, it really got to me. So here's my question, guys. People listening, because they hear all sorts of messaging in network marketing. Some people say, don't go with an older company because they're all dinosaurs. Go with the new company. Well, there's a lot of problems with new companies. Most of them don't last. Let's start there, right? Statistically, for a lot of reasons. Now, once in a while, they do, and you might hit a home run. But you really want to take that chance once you start getting into your third, late 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Take that chance that the company may not last. You might do everything right as a distributor, but the company doesn't last. Therefore, your efforts are, are not. So how does somebody develop the right philosophy? They've joined a company or they're in a company today. How do they establish that philosophy where they start to see this as a generational business, where it becomes the family business, so to speak? Love either one of you guys to just comment on, on, on your thoughts on that, to get that thinking right and confront all the issues that they'll have in building a business, okay? In such a manner where they're thinking not just for today, but for that son, daughter, grandkid that's going to eventually own that distributorship down the road. Joe, let's let's start with you on that. Yeah, I could probably go on for about five hours, maybe a whole weekend on this. We could have a lot of lot of podcasts just on that question. <laughs> yes, you know the great part of our business, like in life, is our people. Uh, but the worst part are people, also. So we, we tend to imagine, if you look at the, the scope of who we attract in network marketing, people from all kinds of background. So about 70% are 
I'm sure Keith agrees with me, are what we call average working human beings. You know, they have a job, regular job, um, you know, doing quite well in most cases. So about 70% 70 of the people are in that category. Then you got about 10, 15%, 20% that are in management roles, vice presidents and presidents of companies possibly, uh, you know, upper management, white collar area, you know, that are probably in that uh, high five figure, early six figure income bracket. And then you have the remaining are entrepreneurs, uh, the go-getters, whether it's five to 10% of the population. So the average person that we're going to attract in this industry, the biggest category is the 70 percenters or 75%, 75% are out there. So those people, majority of them don't have the training, don't have, never have talked about dreams in their life. Probably have very few of them are into personal development, personal growth. They bought into that work for a company for 40, 45 years and retire well, which has, as we know, has gone by the wayside for the most part over the last 10, 15 years. So that category of people um, have so many different philosophies. So uh, for me, the, the biggest part is that you need to have a philosophy from the company down, from the leadership down on commitment, telling the truth, you know, and that's set, setting up proper expectations, education, you know, and uh, personal personal development, um, that has to be built into a long-term plan. However, keep in mind, majority of those people are in it for, because we've been trained, go to work, get paid right away. So it's a complete paradigm shift. And that is why we have a high, or any business out there has a high, very low retention rate because of philosophy, you know, because of the way that we've been taught in society and how we make money. Whereas network marketing is against the grain. It's totally opposite from what the majority of people have been taught, how to make money, how to support their families, you know, and how to, how to develop their, their lifestyle. So um, the philosophy has to come down from the leaders down. Unfortunately, a lot of companies are led. I, um, I had a friend of mine that started a network marketing company a couple of years ago. And like typical startup companies, they attracted lots of quality people, but none of those people have any loyalty because they've been involved in three, four, five companies. They're, just, they're serial entrepreneurs and they're looking for cash, 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 cash. So when I looked at the company, because he wanted a third-party opinion, I went, I, I went and looked at their leadership. I said, uh, you, you have a big problem here, is majority of your leadership have a poor philosophy, and uh, they, you're never going to build a long-term business with these people. It, just because of the philosophy and the types of people that he's attracted. So he understands now what he needs to do uh regarding moving the company to the next phase uh and attracting different types of people uh and and finding loyalty within that core leadership group so if you look at all the billion dollar legacy companies you know the history will always tell you tell us the truth in the future is they had loyalty driven distributors and leaders uh, from the beginning that allowed them to grow past their five years, past their 10 years, past their 15 years, where you see majority of the challenges in, in, the, in those growth periods. It's a great point. A lot, of, a lot of great points in there. And Keith, what, what's your thoughts on that? What, what is the philosophy that gets you there? The philosophy has to, has to live within you. Uh, that I'm committed to whatever it is that I'm doing. Okay. And, you know, a lot of people, to Joe's point, is they're looking for this, this quick fix. They're, they're ad adrenaline junkies, okay? And they want that a adrenaline type of thing. And, that, you know, so you, how do you overcome that? You overcome that by having those hard conversations with someone. 
look, this is, you know, my background is in farming, agriculture. Okay. It's a long-term commitment. You don't think a year out. You don't even think two years out. You think oh. five years out. You're planning <laughs> out what are we going to be doing with this particular property five years from now? Mm. And we're That's making a great a analogy. Great analogy. We're making a decision based right now mm. for how that's going to affect us five years from now. When you're looking at this business and you own, because the point is you own the business, the business is yours. The company is the supplier of the product. They ship, they do the back office stuff. They ship product. They do all kinds of other stuff, legal stuff and, and credit card stuff and whatever. They all do that. And that's a great thing, but you own your business. You have to have that. And you have to look at it of, I'm going to build this business. And then from there, I can transfer it to my children, my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, because I built the foundation. But you can't build that foundation unless you've laid it out in the beginning. You know, to, when you go by a, in a city and you see a skyscraper, okay, the person responsible for that skyscraper is the person that had two people, the person that had the dream and the architect and the engineer that laid out the, that laid out the, the building plans, okay? Because without the dream and without the architect and the plans, that building would not exist, okay? Right. With our, our business is the same way. You have to come back and you have to look at it when you join it. Okay. I'm not joining something for two weeks. I'm not going to try, okay, to do something in network marketing. I'm not going to try to see, I'm not going to see if this works. That's one of the phrases that just drives me nuts. You know, well, I'll, well I'm going to join and I'll, I'll see if it works. Well, it works. The point is you don't. Okay. <laughs> you know, so you have to spend the time to develop that and invest in yourself. Invest in yourself in that plan of what is my business going to look like five years from now? What is it going to look like 10 years from now? What is it going to look at six months from now? Okay. And what am I doing today to make that come into, in, in, into place? You know, once again, you know, part of, part of our farming operation was established by my grandfather in the 1920s. Wow. Okay. Wow. So, you know, that, that generational pass that it go that moves forward, you know. So as we're looking at this stuff, that 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 long term that long term path has to be has to be in your mindset. The other thing that I'm looking. So you want to look for farmers if you want to look for people with long term planning. The other thing is the number one hobby in America is gardening. Gardeners understand you have to prepare the soil, plant the seed, and it takes time. And it takes time for your business and network marketing to develop just like it does in everything else. But you got to lay out those plans and you got to have that, you got to have that planning in place. And that's mm -hmm. why you need great mentors 100%. like what you're doing here, John, with leaving nothing to chance, what Joe is doing for his team and his people. Great, great information. Develop that plan, become the leader you're looking to find, become big foot and continue to build it for a long term. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. in a previous uh, podcast, Keith, I gave a, a great analogy or metaphor on that planting of seeds. So uh, uh, Randy Gage calls this critical thinking in your podcast with him, mm -hmm. uh, uh, John. You know, a, a few years back, I was in the city of uh, Trujillo, Peru. This actually in 2019. And uh, the local leaders took me to uh, a lost city of Chen Chen. Mm. Well, they found this city buried in uh, 1982. So I went, as I was walking through this massive underground city and they were still excavating, uh, all the burial grounds in that city were, there was nothing left. There was no gold, no silver, nothing left. So one of the questions I kept on asking myself for a number of years, you know, spending time in Latin America, uh, why is Latin America so much different than Canada and the United States when it comes to prosperity and wealth? and abundance for the average person, because there is a significant difference. You know, if you go in the city of Lima, there are several hundred thousand squatters in a land just outside the outskirts of Lima that started maybe 30, 40 years ago, where a couple, a couple built a home on a piece of land that they didn't know, own. Nobody did anything about it. And the second families did it, third family. Now they have hundreds of thousands of people in this area that has no running water, no electricity. You know, and I, I went into that uh, uh, city uh, 
that place to do a presentation. I couldn't, my, I had no juice left. So I did it old school because there was no electricity, nothing to plug into, right? <laughs> that was an incredible experience, incredible experience. So the people that own the home, they signed up and they said, Joe, I'll be right back. I've got some cash. So they went into their bedroom, I guess, under their, their mattress, took out the cash <laughs> to, to uh, enroll that day, right? So, so I'm, I'm thinking to myself, why is there so much difference? So if you look at Canada and the United States, it's not logical. Canada and the United States were founded by the same European countries as Latin America. Okay, so Western European countries. So Latin America is primarily Portuguese and Spanish, a little bit of the English and French. Uh, Canada, US, a little bit of the Spanish, the English and the French. So from Mexico down to the tip of Argentina, so much different prosperity and abundance, but they have the same resources as we've all had here in North America and Canada and the United States, but the abundance and prosperity is totally different. I thought to myself, as going through that chen chen, I go, I got it now. Now I understand. So when the Spaniards went into Peru there, they weren't looking for a home. They were looking for wealth. So anything that you could take with them, they went into these burial grounds. They knew they, they could find all these, uh, you know, gold and silver and diamonds or whatever they could get. At, and they sent it all back home or they built they took it and they built the massive churches down there, Catholic churches. Whereas in Canada and the U.S., the reason why we celebrate Thanksgiving is because our settlers came looking for a home for the most part. Mm. So generations later, these people looking for a home, you see the results in Canada and the United States. Whereas in Latin America, they're still trying to catch up. Mm. The foundation that was built in Latin America will take several more generations to even catch up halfway to where Canada and US is today. And I really believe it's because of the foundation that was set up by the settlers. So if Canada and US were built the same way where the English came here and they all they were doing is looking for wealth and there was no plans for making long-term colonies and et cetera, et cetera, we probably would be in the same situation as Latin America. Interesting. So looking for a home. So you see a lot in network marketing, you can take that parallels. So if you come into a company and, and this is what happens with most people, they have intentions where they're going to be here 10 years from now, 15 years from now. I really believe a lot of people do. So they start making money. They get to 5,000 a month, 10,000 a month. As you know, in network marketing, that happens. 15,000 a month, 20,000 a month. And they have this explosion. Everything's going really well. What happens, John, in the financial area is that people start to spend what they make. So they start to lease the cars or buy the cars. They get into a lifestyle that they can afford at that time. But we all know that in business, momentum does, does not happen 24-7. You know, there's going to be times where there's no momentum. And I think what happens is in those times we get addicted to momentum because everything's great. Every, you know, people are ranking and, you know, uh, our checks are going up, commissions are going up. But what happens when it goes the other way, which invariably it always does, invariably it always does. You know, even Apple has gone through it. Microsoft has gone through it. The biggest corporations in the world have gone through it. And so when their income starts to go the other way, now they don't have the income to support the lifestyle. So this is what happens with the thinking is now their goal is not looking at their dream. Their goal is I, I got to sustain this lifestyle. I love this lifestyle too much. Mm. What are they now doing? They're susceptible to other opportunities where they think, okay, I can do this all over again because this company has a better compensation plan. And let's, I'm a, professional startup person. I could really build it fast. But what happens after a year or two years, that same cycle starts to happen again. So their first intentions were 100%. They wanted to be with the company long-term. But because of that situation, looking for a home does not enter their, their mindset at that time. It's, it's survival. 
It's mm. because what we don't want in life is have that big house, have those cars, have the ability to travel. And when we can't do that anymore, what does that say to our neighbors, to our family members? Oh no, John is not as successful. Anymore. I don't see him traveling anymore. What's going on, John? And that's the last thing that we want to see as entrepreneurs is our dreams are fading away because of the struggle. So that, that is just kind of the mindset, but that's why it's so important Brilliant. Looking for a home because that is, as the farmer knows, the great analogy you gave, Keith, you're going to have that long term success where your grandfather created that legacy, your legacy of farming, and look what's happened over the years. And, and you see the same thing in farming where you get a lot of farmers looking for the cash, the GMOs, and all that money that's going there. And then it destroys them because their initial intentions move them away from that home building to uh, how much money can I make now? And, and, and you know, and we, we've seen it. We've seen it with some of our neighbors who are no longer neighbors because they lost their farms. They lost the ranches. They lost the legacy because they were short term. They, you know, that adrenaline junkie type of thing. And those initial things of, well, you know, short term, short term. And short term will put you, will break you in the farming business, short term thinking, yeah. and it's going to break you in your network marketing business. It's you know, addiction that, to, I, it's addiction to momentum. Yeah. Addiction uh, because to we momentum. don't, we, uh, we're not bringing up people, our generation maybe, but the generation before we're coddling our kids. And when they go through some challenges or, you know, uh, if a friend of mine's um, son reached out to me earlier today and he was wanting to quit his job because it was hurting his mindset, hurting his mental health because his boss is being hard on him. Ooh. And I told his, his father, I said, look, you got to help him not to quit, to fight through that because that's where he's going to learn. That's how he's going to build the, the foundation for himself moving forward. But because he knows he has his dad to back him up, to fall back on, that there's a, there's a plan B there, that his dad is always going to look after him. Uh, that's the challenge, right? It's easy to make that decision. And that's why, you know, John, as we're coming up on the end of, of the, the show here today, you know, right. is the point is you have to have a plan to succeed. If you don't have a plan to succeed, you haven't got it laid out. You have a plan for failure. Okay. That, that is the default. The def failing to plan for success, you've defaulted to the plan for failure. Let me do one thing here, guys, because I have one other quick question for you there, and then, then we'll wrap up. I know both, both you guys are busy, and I appreciate, appreciate you guys here, but I got to run a commercial. My wife's giving me a hard time. She says, you never tell anybody about your book. So let me just tell the audience, whoop, I never hold it up right. Moving Up 2020, available on Amazon, as is Leave Nothing to Chance. The show's called Leaving Nothing to Chance. Every Tuesday, live, you can hear the show, okay, on a lot of different podcast companies. But let me ask this last question, guys wealth building because you both have, have become very successful and we don't use numbers because we don't like the FTC to listen to our show, even though they might learn something about the fact that a lot of us do have legitimate businesses in network marketing. But if they were to listen to it or anybody else for that matter, that young guy that you're talking about, Joe, for example, or maybe a guy on the other end of the spectrum who's at you know, the end of his career and he's frustrated and he just hasn't quite made it yet. What's your number one thing that you would tell somebody in terms of wealth building for generational wealth to build in their network marketing business? What's that one thing? If there was only one thing that they were going to remember out of today's show. Keith, let's start with you. Take your network marketing business, develop a secondary stream of income. Do not quit your job. Take that secondary stream of income. Number one, pay off your debt. And then number two, start to invest it. It's awfully nice on the first of the month when the rent checks come in from the rental houses. Okay. It's awfully nice to be able to do that. Don't go out and buy a new car. Don't go out and buy a new house. Don't, and darn sure, don't go out and get a boat. Okay. You know, invest it, you know, so take that, don't quit your job. You know, don't don't shut down your other business. De develop this network marketing business. The beauty of network marketing that most people overlook is the fact that you can build a substantial income 
and a substantial business on a few hours a week, but consistently, okay? Not a few, not a few minutes a week, okay? But a few hours a week, maybe it's one or two hours a day that you put into it as a business. Take that money, invest it, okay? Invest it in, in you know, first of all, pay off your debts, get out of debt. If you're carrying a balance on your credit card, join the network marketing with that dream of getting out of that debt. Number two, if you've got car payments, figure out how you can get out of them, okay? How you can get that car paid off. Then if you've got a mortgage, get that mortgage paid off, okay? I don't care what these financial advisors all tell you, no financial advice, but I can tell you it's really nice when there's no house payment, no car payment, you know, the, pe the, the, the people paying rent are paying it to me. I'm not paying it to somebody else because we were able to take and invest that money. And once again, so often what ch what's challenging with people to develop their wealth is they think it takes a lot of it. A little bit of money applied over a long period of time will create that generational wealth that you can pass on. Maybe that may, you're, may, you're not going out and buying a, a $500,000 house to rent it out. Maybe you're picking up a condominium in a, in a bad part of town that you've did a little work on and now you've got some income coming in because you're able to do that because you've got your network marketing income. That's where the, your income comes in when your money is earning you money. That's what you have to do. Your money has to earn you money. What does network marketing do? It allows you to, you know, John, people talk, talk, oftentimes they say, well, you know, how much it costs to start this business? Next to nothing. Okay. I don't care if, if you're looking at it, $5,000 if it costs. There's some, there are some network marketing things that cost you $5,000 to start. In the reality of business, that's nothing. Okay. But the part that matters most is have you made the financial commitment in your mind to succeed? Are you willing to take the time to get good mentorship, like from you, John, like from you, Joe, and to sit there and develop that plan for success? Because if you don't take the time to do that, you're just simply planning to fail, John. Great point. Joe. You know, Keith, uh, Keith's mindset is as good as his shirt. Incredible. <laughs> The shirt he's wearing. For those that are looking, uh, listening to on the podcast, you, you got to look at the YouTube version of this. Great shirt, John. I'm going to uh, answer this in a different way, uh, just through my journey in network marketing. Unlike Keith, I've been actually, since day one, full-time in this industry. I've not done anything else. I've been 100% focused on my journey here in the network marketing industry was able to retire my wife well over 20 plus years ago. So one of the things that I did is I had a financial plan. Okay. So when I started making the big money, I didn't go and spend it. I had a financial plan. So my first plan was I needed to pay for my kids uh, college education tuition. So I started planning for that actually when they were born. Number two, my other plan was I was saving at least, at least 10% of my income, net income after taxes, 10%, every single way I would just put it into an investment account, never touched it. That's the second thing I did. Number three is I got to a lifestyle that I was comfortable with. I got to a lifestyle that I was comfortable with. So I never went crazy in uh, buying umpteen cars. Uh, I never uh, invested in, uh, in assets that depleted over time. I always invested in assets that grew over time. So what I did with my money is I started investing in real estate. Uh, and uh, I've done really well in that area. You know, and my son's managing a lot of that now, now today. So I've taken my residual income and started making more residual income by, by adding on properties into my portfolio. So those, even when times became tough or were going to be tough, for example, in my mindset, I thought I could always cash out because that was an investment I was making. So one of the challenges that we have, as I shared earlier in our industries and in any industry, when we start to make great money, and you get to six figures, and then you get to seven figures. How many people do you know, John, that have made seven figures in this industry and now broke? Too many. Yes. 
So a million dollars a year, you know, for most of us, it's it's great money. It's incredible money. It's, but you and I can spend a million dollars in within, you know, five minutes if we wanted to right now. Okay. So uh, uh, I always, and that's one of the things that I've taken responsibility a number of years ago. I had um, one of my leaders that was making 80,000 US dollars a month at the time. And again, I'm giving a disclaimer here. Not everyone makes 80,000. She put a lot of work into her business, very sharp business lady. And she asked me for a $60,000 loan. And I thought to myself, oh my God, she's making this kind of money. And she's asking me for this for $60,000. So I was in a leadership dilemma because she was Asian. I knew that took a lot of guts on her part to ask me for the money. And she would lose some face regarding it. And I thought, okay, if I told her no, she'd probably out of spite, move on, even at that level, you know? And I wanna, but the other thing is I wanted to help her under, uh, and get to understand what her finances are because I took personal responsibility that I didn't teach her that part. So when I started looking at her finances, she had a 12,000 square foot home yeah. and it was just her and her husband. They literally had to use cell phones to reach each other in the home. Like it was not a home, it was a palace. It was incredible. She had a office uh, that was, she was, I was helping her with her 25,000 US a month. She had three or four cell phones. She had cars in her garage that she never used. Okay, she had a Lamborghini, a couple of Porsches, you know, that every year were, she was losing money on that, you know, even if she wasn't driving, right? So I thought, oh my God, no wonder. So I asked her what her financial plan is. She had no idea because she was making all this money. It was easier for her to send it out, right? So I was able to create a financial plan, have her save 10% of her income, start building asset instead of spending money on cars. Because cars really, for those, yeah, for those people that love to buy cars like uh, Jay Leno, you know, that's his hobby, loves it. I know Randy Gage has a lot of, he loves uh, a lot of the cars. That's, that's their passion. But for most of us that don't have that passion, it's a waste of money. You know, financially, it, it can burden you financially, you know, uh, in a number of ways, like so many other things. So uh, make a long story short, a financial plan, that's my financial plan that I've had that has allowed me to flourish. It has allowed me also, John, to, when times got a little tough, where I had to fight through, where checks dropped by 50, 60, 70% at times, that allowed me, I wasn't desperate. You know, I built a lifestyle of recurring income, but I, I built a strategy for me to withstand some of the tougher times when there was no momentum. And that always happens to any, anyone in this industry. If you talk to, I know you're going to have Dan McCormick on, another gentleman that's been in industry and with one company for many, many years. So, you know, uh, we all have gone through it. And that financial plan really helped me sustain my growth, sustain my lifestyle, sustain my future, my kids' future. Well, I'll tell you guys, this has been incredible i mean this is this is like a, a living history lesson on what to do because you guys have actually done it and you know i, I mean i was just making some notes on what you guys were saying and just you know take an interest in interest take an interest in interest you here's the difference between people that are are poor versus people who are wealthy in this world the poor guy doesn't pay attention to interest he just keeps paying it you know keith gave kind of a a, a litany there what to pay off first your credit card that's probably your highest interest payment is your credit card Get rid of that first. After that, you look at the car payment. That's probably the second highest interest rate. And the third thing is probably your mortgage rate. Okay. If you get there, you get rid of the first two. Joe gave some sage advice. Okay. Joe and I have lived parallel lifestyles because we did the same thing, Joe, when the kids were little. We started packing away money down here. They call it the 529Cs in the state. And we started putting money away. Well, Fred goes to college next year. He's got a few scholarships, which is good. But the remainder we're going to have to pay. Well, I'm not going to have to pay it. I call MetLife and I tell the guy, 
here's who to send the money to at Dallas Baptist University. And they sent a check and I don't even touch the money. And, you know, and there's enough there that he can go and get an MBA if he wants to or whatever, right? And same with my daughter. And, and, and the point is this, guys and girls listening to this, most importantly, because this show isn't about Keith, it's not about Joe, it's not about me, it's about you. When you listen to this, we're three normal guys who just said, hey, we found companies we liked. And we stayed the course and we went through the ups and the downs. And there's, and Joe and Keith both mentioned there's going to be ups and downs. It's not all up. Contrary to what your sponsor or your company owner tells you, it's never going to be all up. There's going to be like any business, like Microsoft that Joe mentioned or Apple. There's things that happen, ups and downs, okay, in different markets sometimes. But you stay the course. And you get to have that kid's education fund paid for. You get to own the real estate that both of these gentlemen have. You get to have the asset protection. And if either one of these gentlemen goes home to be with the Lord today, their wives and kids are in great shape. So that's uh, why we join these businesses. So one quick story, I promise. A number of years ago, uh, I had on my, one of my goals was to get a Porsche 911, right? With a convertible. I reached my goal and said, okay, I'm going to go buy this car. I'm going to pay cash. So I got all this cash, took it out of the bank, had to sign why, why I want all this cash. And they said, well, you know, you can give them a cashier's check. No, I want the cash. I want to just meant a lot to me just to pay the cash. Right. So I'll go into dealership. I see the car there. I said, can I buy this one? And the, gel- the salesman says, yes, I can order one from you. No, 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 no. I want to buy the one that you have in display here. I'll give you the cash. He says, sir, this is a $125,000 car. I said, yeah, I'll pay. I got the cash. You know, I'm just going to get my briefcase. It's in my trunk and I'll pay for it. So he didn't believe me at first. So I came in. He went to get the manager and security. He thought I was going to steal something, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) And and I said, I told the manager, I'm going to buy this car. Here's the cash. And you should have seen the look on this uh, salesman. It's like he won the lottery that day. The manager was excited and everything else. I jump into the car after signing some papers. I get on the highway. It's a beautiful day here in the Toronto area. And something came over me at that moment. I didn't like myself because I asked myself the question, Joe, why did you buy this car? Is it something that you will enjoy? Is it a passion of yours? Will it give you joy? Or is it because I wanted to show off to my friends, business partners, families, et cetera, that I had the money, cash, and I had a story that I could tell the rest of my life and why I was so successful. And I didn't like the answer. So I put it into third gear, went, went off the highway, turned it around. I went back to the dealership and I broke the salesman's heart. I said, look, I've changed my mind. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, and I told him the truth, what had actually happened. And it was like he had the best day of his life and his worst day of his life. And I, and I said, look, I don't want all my money back. You know, take a couple of thousand. I told the manager, it's my fault. And I, it was a defining moment in my life at that time is because when I invested things in the future, I asked myself this question, will it give me joy? Mm. Am I buying it for the right reasons and so i'm all for abundance and prosperity and going out and thinking big and buying whatever you want getting on that boat get it but if you buy something that is not going to give you joy it's going to be a burden to you it's a bad investment and that's what happened to me john financial wow. great story well and, and you know what it just illustrates it's like hey good financial stewardship with a good long-term company, with a good business plan. And you could have had that Porsche if you if you wanted it, but I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. I'm just, I'm real low key on everything. I uh, my, my son, and we'll end with this guys, because we could go on for hours and we're probably going to have more shows on this subject, by the way, because it's, it's too good and there's too much education. But I told my son, he's 18 now. He's like, Dad, what's the first book I really need to read? And of course, I told him my books. But I said, okay, if you want to read read my books, I said, The Millionaire Next Door. Because to that point, somebody with money doesn't need to tell you they have money. You know they have money when you talk to them because the the, the acumen that they have in a way that they talk about different. But when you guys got started in the industry in the 80s, that's what it was all about in the early 90s. Oh, yeah. It It was flash and dash. 
Well, you know what, Joe, it's a perfect illustration. And Keith, when I joined, and I'll, I'll mention the company that I was with because it's a very large one and, and I'm not with it anymore, but you're all familiar with it. It's Herbalife, it's where I started my career in 1983. And Herbalife was doing extremely well when I joined. Uh, it had done 2 million, 10 million, uh, 2 million, 10 million, 58 million, 140 million was the year that I joined. Wow. And, and the next year, it went to 512 million. But it had some issues. Food and Drug Administration, Federal Trade Commission, lots of bad press, uh, young, super talented. Mark Hughes was as talented as human beings ever has existed, probably on the planet. But he made some mistakes and, and he took on the wrong people, the federal government. And, uh, and they crushed them. And the cars in the Saddlebrook Marriott Hotel in New Jersey, where we used to do our meetings, uh, were like Porsches and Jags and all, of, you know, all the high end cars. And within 90 days, those high-end cars were all gone. Now, the distributors were still there, same people, but all of a sudden there were Volkswagens and, you know, to me, civilized cars. And it taught me a lesson because I'm very young at the time. I'm just out of college. And it taught me a really valuable lesson, which was do not wear your wealth, do not drive your wealth, okay? Impress your accountant every year. Don't try to impress your next door neighbor to Joe's point that that Porsche would have impressed some people for about five minutes. And then they would have said, Joe's lost his mind. Who spent who spends one hundred twenty five thousand dollars on a car? Why? Lots of people do. And it's all the yeah. power to them. Yeah. With me, it was uh, it was just total ego. And I was because of the personal development. I recognized that I didn't like the answer. Yep, but nothing, nothing wrong with that. If that look, if that's your dream is the car, that that's fine. Let's clarify that. But to Joe's point, he had better uses. He had a young family at the time. He had better uses for that money to put it away and build his financial fortress and accumulate interest than to be driving it. Okay, I use one other simple example, and 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 uh, I want to thank both these gentlemen for their time. But uh, watches, right? I wear my sports watch because it's practical. Okay, because it tells me my steps. And it costs, I don't know what it costs, a couple hundred bucks. And somebody said to me one day, they said, don't you have a Rolex? And I said, I had a Rolex that a company had given me as an incentive. And I left it in a hotel in Chicago. And I, and I, I cried all the way back to New York when I got on the plane and realized I'd lost my, I went kind of to a hotel. They never found it. Imagine that. Wow. And all of a sudden I realized, I went to the store the next day and I bought a Timex. And I realized the Timex and the Rolex told exactly the same time. And if I left a Timex in a hotel room, I wasn't going to give it a second thought. And that's how you guide your thinking so that you wind up accumulating from your business that generational wealth that's available that both Keith and Joe have lived and continue to live. And so Rolex, I want to both. John, the Rolex is a great investment, though. <laughs> Very good investment. <laughs> okay, especially, especially that, that one was great because it was free. But yeah. <laughs> I love, nonetheless, I lost it. And some, some, some lady in Chicago's husband probably has a really nice Rolex to this day. But yeah, anyway. to, to Joe's point, the, my Rolex that I bought, that my wife bought for me for my birthday in 1985. Okay, is worth a lot more money than, than it was paid for. Than she paid for. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Nice, nice, nice wife, Keith. Well, you know, it was interesting, Joe, when my wife and I got married. And uh, two weeks before we got married, she said, Okay, this is how this works. I'm quitting my job. My job is to spend it, and your job is to make it. And so for 34 years, that's been our, that's been our, uh, our, 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 the way we've, the way we roll. I make it, she spends it. <laughs> And, and Joe, I have to say, being in Keith's downline, anytime I've been in California, he picks me up and he doesn't take me to the French Laundry. That's true. That's true. Is it a French well, Laundry? Well, you know. I've been there once before. Let's do it as a threesome in the future. There you go. And there you go. There it. you go. All right, okay, guys. John, thanks for having thanks, me. Thanks, Amazing thanks, show, Pete. guys. Thank you both. God bless. God bless to all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Leave Nothing to Chance. If you want to know more about what it takes to succeed in the network marketing space, join us again next week for another amazing episode. For additional resources and to connect with John Soliter, visit leavingnothingtochance.com. Don't forget to leave a review and we'll see you next time.